Welcome to the show. This is Brandon Wen, and you're listening to the Understanding Consumer Neuroscience Podcast, brought to you by the folks at Cloud Army. In this episode, Richard talks to Tom Noble about the fundamentals of consumer neuroscience. Hi, I'm Richard Campbell, and welcome to this Introduction to Consumer Neuroscience audio series. We're going to do a little exploration on uh, what consumer neuroscience is all about and how it can help marketing, especially in this time of pandemic. To begin the series, I'm talking to Tom Noble. Thank you for coming out, Tom. Hi there. How are you doing? I'm great, and and I'm really excited to start this conversation and this whole series of uh, exploring what uh, consumer neuroscience can do for us. Uh, but we, we got to know a little bit more about you because you come from a marketing background. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. I had sort of two careers, really, and the first one was a, a kind of marketing career. Yeah, I'm working for big international businesses like GlaxoSmithKline, Diageo, Walt Disney Corporation. Whilst I was doing that, that uh, the whole idea of looking at how science can help marketers sure. sort of first came to fruition, really. Yeah, I mean, this speaks to this idea of market research in general. Like, you, As a marketer, what were your usual approaches to market research and why did you think you needed it in the first place? Well, as a marketer, you, know, you really need help in understanding your consumers or shoppers or whatever. Mm -hmm. And you rely essentially on your intuition on the one hand. Right. But the intuition plus, you know, what more you can learn about the people who actually you're intending to sort of interest in your product or your service. And for that, you rely on the market research industry to to help you with that and the different techniques that they have, which are, you know, really geared to do two things. One is to help predict how what you come up with is likely to be reacted to in the marketplace um, in terms of how people are likely to behave and the decisions they're likely to make, mm -hmm. uh, having been exposed to your ideas or your materials or whatever. And secondly, to help you understand why that is. So you, there's a kind of learning process along the way. So there's still that sort of creative part of coming up with an idea of how you want to present your product to the market, and then the market research will test that idea for you before you put it out there? So goes the theory, yes. Mm -hmm. The idea is that you come up with ideas or somebody comes up with ideas, and then you check them out. Um, as I say, that's where the problems <laughs> really started, <laughs> because you know what you get back typically isn't really as helpful as you'd like it to be. Sure. I mean, one could also argue if I simply do the campaign, that's the ultimate test, just an expensive one. Yes. And I think that is the, that is the challenge. Mm -hmm. It is expensive. And to put right, it will cost a fortune. And if you think about, you know, uh, t take uh, some, of the, some of the first kind of projects we got involved with in this new world of the kind of new neuroscience applications, mm -hmm. um, was in the car industry. And you can imagine sort of like, you know, the effort that goes into creating uh, a model or a, um, a prototype vehicle um, and then testing it out and then finding that actually that's not going to work. Right. Um, there's a lot of money and a lot of time that's been wasted. And as you know, the old adage about marketing investment anyway is that, you know, 50% of it is wasted and you never really quite yeah. Know which half it is. Which half. <laughs> I, I do like your car scenario, especially because often you can, they produce these beautiful concept cars and people ooh and awe ah over them. But it doesn't mean they actually put their money down to buy them. No. And I think therein lies the problem is what people say is not, um, <laughs> not really necessarily that helpful. That's really interesting because because when I think market research, when you say that right off the bat, I do think about focus groups and sort of testing material in front of people that often you're paying. Yes. So there's that was one of the challenges, mm -hmm. you know, where you may get certain biases um, that people feel ingratiated or whatever and will say something. But you also get the reverse effect where people, let's say they get playful. Right. Um, and they will do the opposite. Uh, and, and they assume that you know, the person who's moderating the focus group or whatever um, is actually working for that company. And then so they get a little playful, shall we say, and uh, make it difficult for, for the moderator. But th there's a more fundamental problem than, than that, mm -hmm. which is, you know, which I, I guess is the key really to sort of help helping us understand about how perception is, is kind of formed and, and how uh, decisions are made. We now know much more about that than we did 20, 30 years ago. And 
what people say is is usually pretty uninformed, if you like, about what is actually going on in their in their at their non conscious level, right? Um, which either they can't articulate or they're just not in connect. You just they couldn't possibly be aware of the motivations and the um, mental nudges, if you like, the impulses that are pushing them in one direction or another. Are we in an interesting time right now where most people don't understand how they make their own decisions then? I think that's always been the case, yes. um, but we only know that that's the, the case. Um, and But of course, we only know a little bit more than we knew a few years ago, but what we know is uh, pr- profoundly different, different, I think, mm-hmm. and, um, and is becoming really quite helpful in you know, marketers who are interested in really understanding, you know, what, what prompts people to action and right. what's really going on in their mind as opposed to what they will tell you. We're just really at the beginning of sort of understanding a whole new kind of way of looking at research and, and trying to get more predictive from engaging with consumers and trying to extract, you know, sort of, sort of um, how, how they're genuinely feeling about things. Interesting. And in the end, this is about cost effectiveness too so when these techniques are applied you do get better results yes so the notion really is that if you understand what it is that that sort of shifts people's perceptions mm-hmm. and is likely to trigger behavior and then you apply that learning then you're more likely to develop strategies are more likely to have the effect that you the, the desired effect mm-hmm. if you like therefore you're in a stronger position all around and the money that you're investing is directed and invested more uh, effectively. So your ROI is, is much stronger. So d- did you encounter consumer neuroscience as a marketer first? Yes, I did. Yeah, yeah. So what were you looking for? As a frustrated marketer. Okay, yeah. So yeah, yeah. you were clearly in pursuit of something. I was very frustrated because, you know, having spent a lot of my time working with creative agencies as a marketer mm-hmm. in advertising, and in you know, a design work and so on and innovation and to see ideas sort of constantly sort of trashed by the market research outcomes, uh, which to me always felt intuitively wrong. I mean, like a lot of the time I'd attend a debrief and, and really quite excited that, you know, I think there was something that the agency folks had come up with, which was really, really kind of uh, exciting and, and kind of potent and, and really sort of capture people's imagination and then to be told well no you know you should definitely shouldn't pursue that and the research tells us that you're way off being there and you know uh, just sometimes intuitively felt wrong Interesting. and then the uh, the suggestions from the the market research um industry and the eight market research folks about how you might um modify the idea seemed even more crass <laughs> and tended to sort of you know emasculate the idea altogether, you know, suck out all the energy and all the kind of emotional pizzazz, you know, which is hard enough to create in the first place. And I'd see these uh, and sometimes be sort of uh, induced to follow these recommendations. And we'd end up producing stuff and launching it. And it was a complete flop. Right. No interest really from the consumers, despite what they would tell you. And you think, hang on a second. This is just this is all very, very frustrating. I wonder whether we should be backing our own intuition and, and listening more to the agencies actually and along just by happenstance i was introduced to a couple of guys who were experimenting with these new techniques and yeah and uh, and, and uh to cut a long story short within i don't know within about 12 months i'd set up a business with that wow it literally changed your career at that point yeah i, I jumped off those sort of corporate bandwagon if you like and and mm-hmm. set up um a a business uh, which which was really adopting these kind of new ideas, uh, which came from neuroscience and techniques that were used clinically and then modified for use in the kind of more commercial world. They're quite primitive, actually, in those very, okay, very right. early days. And then successively over the last 20 years um, have become more and more sophisticated. And the kind of interpretation of the results has become sort of much more informative and more meaningful. You know, here we are today, so like 20 years on, where they become... Uh, you know, a lot more commonplace, uh, absolutely a million miles from being dominant, but more and more companies are dipping their toe in the water now um, and others are using them sort of more systematically. Awesome. So I'm I'm going to mm-hmm. jump back a little bit here because I could see this picture yeah. now of you as as the head of marketing for a group in a triangle of an agency that's cr- cr- creating marketing items, you know, being that creative force and a research group 
you know, maybe all separate. And so mm. you're getting these things developed by an agency. It's going through the research testing and they're coming back with, you know, problems with it. And then when you take their advice, it dilutes something you thought was exciting. And you sort of in this question then of, do I ignore the research and do my instinct, which sort of goes against kind of the age of reason mindset of measurement is good, mm -hmm. or we just mm -hmm. say the measurements are bad here, because in the end, their suggestions did not produce good results. Yes, that's right. And I, and I think the, 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 ch the problem was really that the techniques that are being used have sort of evolved over sort of 30, 40, 50 years. Um, and they all were, I mean, it sounds crazy, but they, uh, in, to, 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 to sort of challenge it, but at the time, um, which is, you know, like, how on earth could you do this without asking people questions? Right. Surely, you, in order to get some information from people, how they're feeling about stuff, well, ask them, because isn't that what therapists do, right. for example? So if you want to understand somebody's inner workings, just ask them a bit more deeply or employ somebody who's a psychologist who can, who can do that. And I, I suppose that's where the, um, the epiphany was really that, that it's not about that. It's about people are unaware of what, what, what really drives them right. into forcing choices and things or induces choices is probably a better expression. Um, and it was just happened to coincide with, you know, more and more work coming out from neuro labs, uh, the, the, uh, the, the cognitive neuroscientists beginning to really look into things like, you know, what, what induces um, uh, Alzheimer's and, and uh, dementia and so on. So the clinical stuff, which was, was allowed by the introduction of fMRI machines back in the early 80s. Interesting. Um, that allowed neuroscientists for the first time really to sort of study healthy brains rather than um, war-damaged war, uh, veterans, essentially. Right. Um, and so it, it allowed uh, a whole new kind of insight, if you like, as, as to how that how cognition was kind of working. And um, out from that early work, and then subsequently more and more has been ploughed into um, this whole area of, of decision science, if you like, and trying to understand how you know cognition works essentially. And from that, you know, it was a challenge to the traditional way of of gleaning information and insights from from consumers um uh, we you know it was a, a new approach was very much about trying to measure things at the non-conscious level because it's the non-conscious that is a really important driver of perception and, and behavior and so because these scientists were able to use fmri to watch a healthy brain in action in real time mm. Uh, mm. you know are initially for very medical reasons the byproduct of that for in the consumer world was starting to see how minds actually react to marketing yes i mean so so the origins were very much uh, obviously medic medically based mm -hmm. uh, and a good reason um but obviously the more work that was done there the more the kind of spin off into the more commercial application and the commercial desire if you like to understand more about you know how we make basic everyday decisions about when we go to the, the local local supermarket, you know, why do we pick this up rather than that up? Right. So the, and so mm. the, the effect of branding and of packaging and of marketing and presentation, I mean, all of these elements that go into, they do have an effect and they, this is what these technologies could show us then that, that there really was an effect on the brain, the, all of these different elements. Yes. It did everything from how, how the brain decides how much attention to, to give things. Mm -hmm. And uh, the importance of emotional engagement, if you like, in a piece of communication, in some advertising, for example. If you don't get a, uh, emotional engagement, you really uh, nothing is likely to shift in terms of perception. Right. Um, and how memory gets activated. These are the kind of things, those three things in particular, the kind of attentional levels, emotional levels, and memory activation, and how those things kind of interacted with, with one another were the, were the beginnings of the, the industry, really. Um, and it, it, well, we mentioned fMRI, but EEG as well, which has been around actually since um, you know I, I, I think maybe a hundred years. Right. Actually, um, you know, it's become more sophisticated, and there are other kinds of scanners as well. All of these things have have helped to kind of cast more light into the whole kind of way that that, that our brains work. And but again, not to not to um, uh, to overstress it, you know, it, we really are still at the beginnings of all of this. Sure. 
But what we've learned so far is that the way that we as marketers used to think about how decisions were made has been fundamentally challenged. And so new models and new frameworks are being introduced for all kinds of different interactions and in, um, marketing kind of activities. So instead of focus groups where we ask people questions, we put them all into uh, MRI machines? Sounds cool, but a little expensive. In the early days, um, in the very early days, <laughs> it was a little bit like that. You oh, know, yeah. the, the tools on offer, um, the very you know origins of the, uh, the, the industry were fMRI interventions and EEG and yeah, sticking electrodes on people's heads mm -hmm. and shoving them into fMRI machines, like you say. Um, quite scary, um, a lot of white coats, and the respondents treated more as subjects. Right. As opposed to the, the, you know, the softer kind of terminology and things that the market research was in. Yeah, the uh, warm and to. fuzzy of a focus group, right? With Danish and coffee and, and, and uh, slides. Much friendlier. Yes. So the whole thing was pretty scary. And, and you can imagine, you know, as we did going out to clients and saying, you know, you know, if you do this stuff, you, you're going to get deeper insights into, you know, what sort of motivates consumers and how you can develop strategies and, and campaigns and things are going to be more effective. And they kind of look at you and think, you're mad. You know, <laughs> <You're> <laughs> you, want, you want me to do what? <laughs> Go away and come back in 10 years time. This was pretty much the story. Yeah. And sure enough, I mean, even now, I, uh, people will call me up from years and years ago and said, do you remember you came to see us? And I go, yeah, vaguely. Yeah. They said, you know, well, you were completely bonkers, we thought, but <laughs> now we think there might be something in it. In fact, you know, we know that lots of people are using these tools and we think it's about time we had to go ourselves. Right. So come and tell us, you know, do we still have to do that stuff? And then we said, well, no, no, no. Things have moved on dramatically since then. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, technology's evolved and the science has evolved. And the techniques are now, uh, as you're well aware, you know, more and more of these things are available online, or at least versions of them. And so it's a benign kind of testing regime now is, is the norm, as opposed to something where you need to go into a facility, perhaps even change your clothes. <laughs> right. Uh, or, or have, you know. Or, have, or shave clothes, your head. Uh, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So much of the work is done, you know, on webcams and, and uh, you know, on tablets, smartphones and, and desktops. Interesting. So the technology that we have today is now able to read. I mean, I guess they're not reading brainwaves anymore, but understanding people's behavior visually rather than electronically. Yes. So there's a number of kind of common techniques. I mean, the ones that, you know, some of the listeners will be probably uh, more familiar with are things like um, eye tracking. Mm -hmm. So using the webcam on your desktop. So you calibrate where on the screen you're looking, right. you know, looking up, you know, um, uh, which will allow us to understand what it is that in, say, uh, a film or a, a piece of TV advertising or some AV will al allow us to identify where you're looking at any particular moment in time. Mm -hmm. um, or facial coding is another example where a camera will read the sort of micro expressions in your face, which will tell us you know, the degree to which you're sort of surprised or, you know, happy or sad about something, you know, some, some very basic emotions actually in that case. Um, or another technique, which is, um, you know, used, which is probably the most widely used technique is implicit, uh, response testing, mm -hmm. which allows us to measure the speed with which you're recognizing something. And there the, is, is an indication of the, the, the strength of that kind of feeling. So, the, the, and that's more of a gamified computer, almost like a computer type of game in a way, where you're throwing up primes in front of people and seeing how quickly they are able to respond to them in but, a particular way. And prim allows primes, you're not meaning the numbers, but objects? What are the yes, primes? primes in a, in a, in a, yes, primes. Yes, sorry. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Um, so, primes could be, um, you know, different designs or right. different ideas or propositions or plot lines for cinema, mm -hmm. for, for, for films and things like that. A anything really that's uh, what we call stimulus, right. you know, something that you put in front of people to evoke some kind of response. That's the sort of currency, if you like. That's what we use. And we have a range of different techniques um, as neuromarketers, a sort of toolkit, if you like, of different things that allow us to measure different things. Mm -hmm to really get smarter about the nature of their response, the response patterns, and then the likelihood to trigger certain um, actions and intents. So rather than the old way of just ask them questions and evaluate mm -hmm. their answers, you're putting them in 
environments with primes, then measuring their responses to that that are more subconscious. Yes, that's exactly it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so and that's their response time, their facial expressions, where they look. Like that to me makes a lot of sense. That that, that those are my, those are subtle things. Those are the small things that they're not directly controlling. That you don't get that uh, positive bias. That oh, someone's asked me a question, I'm going to have to produce an answer. This seems to avoid all of that just by walking them through this sort of gamification and then measuring their response time. That, that, that's right. That, that's it. I mean, it's it's very challenging in many ways to um, ask people to respond to, you know, something that's a graphic or an image, for example. Mm-hmm. Tell me what you think of it, the moderator might say in a research group. Well, most people would think, I don't have the slightest idea how to even begin to answer that question. Right. That's what they would think. But they will be encouraged to say something. Yes. And then they look around and somebody over there says, well, I think it's a load of rubbish. And they say, yes, you're absolutely right. I think it's rubbish too. Or, <laughs> oh, no, no, I think it's rather, you know. And, and we'll, I tell you, as humans, you know, we know we're, we're, we're really good at making stuff up. Yes. You know, we're certainly very good at coming up with a very plausible, rational reason that why we do the things we do and think the things we think. For those in the audience who, who know about depth interviews, where you maybe take one or two people and go beyond a focus group and maybe talk to them for an hour, probing deeper and deeper as to their motivations for liking something or buying something. You know, those people are very, very good at um, talking for uh, up to an hour about the, the, the rationale for why they did it and, you know, the brain helping them uh, appear very sort of logical and rational and cons- because that's what our brain thinks, you know, is good for our ego. It's appropriate. And, yeah. and it could absolutely, it could be total nonsense, total nonsense. Well, and I would argue it probably is. You know, I think one of the challenges you run into as a marketer is you care very deeply about the product you're marketing. And so you're delighted when you find someone else that's willing to talk to it for about an hour, where I don't think the average consumer of your product cares that much. Absolutely. But the mind invents these things. Most of the time. Yeah. And so you fall into your own cognitive biases here. Right. So on the subject of cognitive cognitive biases, I mean, that's really at the heart of all this, Mm -hmm. is that we don't realize just how many cognitive biases we have. The brain has got a zillion things to do, you know, uh, 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 during the course of its day, and it has to constantly make decisions. And in order to do that, um, if it were to, to have to think about each of those decisions from the start, you know, every single time, it'll just, would just jam up essentially. So, so it creates little uh, routines and, and learns from memory uh, how to kind of shortcut and jump to conclusions essentially. And that's, you know, the, the, the basis of, um, of, uh, biases and things that, that I see this. Therefore, I know that that means that. And therefore I can move on to the next thing. So little things that signify this and that and the other. I, I can decode in milliseconds. Right. Without even realizing it. And this is where the whole area of implicit biases, you know, becomes kind of topical is it on, on racism, which is a very, very topical thing at the moment, of course. And quite rightly, people understand the notion of implicit bias and, and racial bias, for example. But it's quite possible for, um, and probable that many, many people just from the way they were brought up or the environment they were brought up will have racial biases. That's not the point. The point is how one overcomes that in terms of behavior. Right. Um, and so it's, it's, it's not, you know, it's, it's a normal thing to have these kind of biases, political biases and whatever else. It doesn't mean to say that that's going to shape and, and, and uh, form the way you behave. That's other things. It's how you actually, uh, you know, decide to, or how you feel about stuff in terms of uh, overcoming it. Yeah. Does that make sense? Absolutely, yeah. And and it is an overall challenge, and it, it does speak to this period of time that we're in right now mm. where we there is a lot of forces acting on us all the time, and lots of people feel overwhelmed, mm. too much information, and uh, are trying to make assessments even faster. And I think it's a very challenging period for marketers, knowing that your customer is only going to give you a small amount of their attention and you so treat it gently, treat it well, and still get a positive result from it. Uh, so the tools to me seem very interesting. Like what you're describing, I thought it, w- it was relatively easy to write questions in focus groups. I think it's going to be pretty tough to build these kinds of tests. 
yes, I mean, the tests rely on um, trying to measure the things that, you know, the cognitive neuroscience would tell you really count. Mm -hmm. So you know, your point about uh, glimpses of attention, that's often all you get. Right. And so what is it that's likely to grab attention in the first place, particularly when somebody's perhaps not even looking for a particular product or right. on a shelf or whatever? What is it that just naturally grabs the eye? Uh, that's an important factor. What is it that is likely to get them to invest the brain, to invest, you know, precious energy into looking at your pack rather than somebody else's pack? Mm -hmm. And what is it that's likely to make them perhaps go as far as to pick it up and sort of decode it and then think about, well, shall I or shan't I? You know, those are the kind of steps along the way, perhaps, in a very simplified way of looking at it. So understanding whether something's going to grab attention, whether something's going to engage it emotionally, and what it evokes in the mind of the consumer, feelings, values, benefits, etc., that come to mind as quickly as possible, as powerfully as possible. These are the kind of thing that, things that preoccupy marketers' minds and, and strategies. And now there are a series of tools that allow us to, perhaps better than before, measure the likelihood of your pack or your advertising or your proposition actually engaging people and in, in, in getting the kind of result that you're looking for. Do you see consumer neuroscience applicable everywhere, like every kind of marketing? Or are there only certain areas that should really focus on using neuroscience? Well, I think, you know, um, marketing and, and um, people's responses to products and services that they might be interested in engaging with or buying or, or whatever is just really another facet of communication. Mm -hmm. You know, it could be politics. Um, it could be dating. It could be, it's basically human interaction and communication. Sure. It's relevant actually in all those fields. And, and perhaps it's not surprising that these kind of tools are finding their way into so many different, um, areas, including education, including law and other stuff. Um, because it's essentially the way the brain decodes information and responds to messaging and to other humans, you know, there are patterns to it. Mm -hmm. Cognitive neuroscience is looking at this stuff and looking at it from a culture perspective, from different types of stimulus perspective, and trying to help us kind of get smart, if you like, about, you know, what the kind of norms are and the best practices, if you like. Sure. And for those companies, that uh, this exploration of finding new ways to better understand the consumer and the shopper, uh, as we're talking marketing in the main, that, you know, the more that you use the stuff, the more that you do see patterns emerging. You know, they're relevant to your category or to your particular brand or service. And you can learn from that. And it means that the next time you go about creating something new and different or trying to communicate something, you have a, you know, a more informed view about what's likely to work and what's not likely to work, what's going to trigger things and what's not. I would also think it would really help when you do try to expand into different cultural markets that they have it, that the marketing that worked in one a culture isn't going to work in another and that you can do coherent research on what are the mechanisms that work in that new market you're trying to get into. Yes. I mean, what the cognitive neuroscientists and psychologists would tell you is that the way the brain works, you know, healthy brain works is, is pretty universal from what we understand. Mm -hmm. But, you know, culturally things can be quite different because, you know, we react to symbols and, and environments very differently. They have different meaning. Mm -hmm. But the processes by which meaning is formed are, are similar. And the, the, the process by which one can sort of decode this information is also quite similar. Um, so there's a, a universality, if you like, about the introduction of neuroscience applications to the world of kind of marketing and commerce. But the way the results you would get could be quite different from country to country and from, you know, uh, in, in different communities. And that's a question we get asked an awful lot by <coughs> marketers around the world is, oh, if this stuff, you know, does tend to be more universal in the way the brain works, does that mean we should, uh, we could cut back and perhaps only test uh, in two or three countries <laughs> rather than in the 10 or 20 we were intending to? And the right. answer is probably, well, I, no, I don't think so because, yeah. you know, the, 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 the same, the, take color just as an example. Color is a great, great example, actually, I think, because, you know, it's been extremely difficult to meaningfully test the effect of color, if you like, in the, in the, in the realm of marketing, um, in any, in any way that you can really sort of think is credible. 
um, until these new techniques have come along. <clears throat> and of course, you know, colors can mean uh, can, uh, very different things to different communities and used in different contexts. And now you can start to measure these things. It's, it really is a, is a fascinating area in itself, just color, looking at color. Sure. Uh, I, I mean, I think about it for us in the West where red means stop and green means go. But that's just a cultural thing, right? In different, different parts of the world, it, they may all have different meanings. Yes, yes. And, and symbols can mean very, very different things, as, as we know, um, and can create all kinds of tensions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, having spent a, a lot of my kind of earlier marketing life in international marketing, you know, the, the, the number of times that we were caught out by using symbols or um, setups in terms of advertising stuff that, were just wrong, plain wrong right. for certain communities. They just evoke complete the wrong message. And so understanding those triggers and things, it, you know, and being able to measure them allows you to become much more culturally sensitive and therefore effective. Mm -hmm. you know, the more informed you are, the, the more you have the, the choice to be sensitive to these things. Yeah, this, this is interesting because it, you could take this same testing methodology that's relatively universal and even apply similar tests to different cultures and you will get different results and they may reveal that mistake before you make it in the public. Yes. You only have to have a save like that once and you've justified an awful lot of effort because, uh, you know, there are famous cultural blunders in, in marketing over the years that I'm sure everyone could think of right away. And, yes. uh, and th yes. th the fact that you would have a chance to pick up on that ahead of time and be able to correct it is very powerful. Exactly. Exactly. And it also the desire of the, you know, typically the, the, the global marketer, is trying to, uh, in some sense, trying to get as much consistency across the world sure. in terms of how they communicate because it's a cost effective model. However, it, is it, is it that, you know, how much degrees of freedom should you allow the local markets to tap into the, the local sensitivities and, and be altogether more effective by tweaking a few things here and there? You know, it's not to say that traditional market research hasn't been able to help in some way in doing that. I, it's just that these more sophisticated tools that are, are, are tapping in more to the non-conscious kind of um, response patterns are, are more sensitive, I think, to that. And it actually highlight things that perhaps wouldn't be reflected if you actually ask people. Right. Yeah. Well, and it, I don't think it's that difficult in a focus group to pick up on revulsion right, for a serious blunder like that. But to actually get to a positive interaction, that that's the best way to present that. That's a much more subtle thing. Uh, that pe that that this form of testing that neuroscience would have a more success with. Mm. So I, mm. I appreciate the the difference there. It's not enough just not to to make a blunder. It's have a good result in a new market too. Yes, yeah. It's like, it's understanding what it is that's causing the blunder, or the revulsion, or whatever it is, mm -hmm. and and then you know figuring out well, okay, if you understand that, you're in a much stronger position to um, replace that. Is something that is altogether more kind of positive and meaningful, if that's what your intention was. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm. Well, Tom, I think I feel like I've gotten a good introduction here. There are other conversations to be had, but clearly it's an interesting area that sort of modernizes market research as a whole. Uh, it's a great day when the traditional lines up with the with the progressive approach. But mm. I think I would stop what I was doing when they disagreed and take a good long look and say, like, why are these disagreeing? Like, you know, what can we surface on that? But it's, yeah, you're right. It's a whole other conversation, one we could probably dive into in a later series. I, I feel armed today. Like, I've got a bunch of great ideas on why I'd want to explore this further now because mm. it does fit in with a, a lot of interesting thinking and, and these problems around market research. Mm. Uh, Tom, thanks so much for spending the time. Pleasure, absolute pleasure. Really lovely to talk to you. And uh, stand by for the next in the series. Talk again. Mm.